the importance of orientation and reason, freedom and patriotism in liquid crystal. So there we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Okay, so I don't need the microphone. I'm Lech Longa. I come from Krakow. Krakow is my home city. Um, I work at the Agronia University. I'm a theorist working on soft matter. But I'm also uh, interested in synchronization of dynamical networks, which is in our recent work in my group. But today I'm going to give you an introductory talk about the orientational degrees of freedom and their role in uh, liquid crystals. I do not have that many beautiful pictures as my colleague had in his previous lecture, but I can promise you that I have many beautiful formulas to show you. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's start. As you know very well, the simplest way, well, one way in which matter can change its qualitative, not quantitative, but qualitative properties are phase transitions. And actually, majority of phase transitions go via symmetry breaking mechanisms. But that's of course not always the case. For instance, standard liquid gas phase transition is not associated with any sort of symmetry breaking, as you know very well. Also, a phase transition that you observe in icing magnets, they are also not connected with symmetry breaking. But in liquid crystals, I would say 95% of phase transitions are connected with symmetry breaking. So, this mechanism underlying phase transitions in liquid crystals, I'm going to explain you in some detail during my talk. Probably some of these issues I'm going to discuss were already touched upon in the previous lectures. For instance, in the lecture of Mike Allen. But nonetheless, even if you hear it for the second time, I think it's not bad. As phase transitions are concerned, <coughs> liquid crystals are really a paradise for someone who likes studying phase transitions. You observe just to name a few things, all the parameters of various symmetries, anisotropic scaling behavior, coupled all the parameters, multiplicial points, white critical domains, etc. Of course, the very important aspect is also defect mediated phase transitions. Also, curiously, you observe reentrant phase transitions in liquid crystals. For instance, Nematic phase can appear at high temperatures, then you may observe some low symmetry phase like smectic, and again nematic. So it's quite unusual. And you may observe also phase transitions induced by geometries and external field. <coughs> Last but not least, you may also observe a coupling between various landscapes that produce you phase transitions and interesting. Uh, phenomena. For instance, orientational order, mesoscopic orientational order in elastomers can couple with macroscopic deformations, leading to fantastic phenomena as you probably have heard from different lectures. Of course, I can't cover all this subject. This is actually one year lecturing. So I actually want to concentrate myself on the simplest picture, theoretical picture that you use to describe phase transitions. Namely, I will tell you what spontaneous symmetry breaking is and how relevant are distribution functions to understand the mechanism of spontaneous breaking of symmetry. Then I will tell you something about the mean field theory, the fundamental theoretical tool to understand what's going on in the medium, and if time allows me to do so, I will show you how to go from the mean field theory to Landau description. You probably have heard a little bit about landau degen theory in the course of, of this week, and the previous one perhaps. 
So here I might, if time allows me to do so, show you how this theory actually can be derived from a more fundamental microscopic description. Okay, so let's see. Um, before I start, let me define my notation. As I said, there will be plenty of beautiful formulas in my talk, so it's good first to discuss the nomenclature. So, my talk will be about theoretical approach like mean field, but nonetheless I will try to illustrate many ideas I'm going to talk about with computer simulations that you probably have heard in my Allen's talk. Okay, in my talk I will actually be limited to the molecules that are axially symmetric, say ellipsoid of, uh, let's say, uh, molecules being of ellipsoidal shape. For such kind of molecules, I need actually uh, five degrees of freedom to parameterize them. And these involve rotations. So actually, these could be taken regard of by defining a unit vector along the molecular axis. So omega means rotations, and r means positions of centers of mass of the molecules. Now, in my formulas, trace means integration over positions and orientations, where integration over pos orientations is just uh, rotationally invariant integration over d phi and d theta, the angles that describe the orientation of the unit vector omega j with respect to the laboratory system of frame. So that will be the notation. And now let me remind you a few, uh, let me give you a, an introduction to thermodynamics, to statistical mechanics just in two transparencies. I hope you have heard about Shannon entropy. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, fantastic. So, you know that the whole equilibrium, I'm going to talk about equilibrium statistical mechanics. So, actually, I will show you how equilibrium statistical mechanics can be derived in two transparencies. For that, we use the notion of Shannon's entropy. As you know, uh, the basic a statistical function which can be defined for n particle system is the n particle distribution function. It gives you a probability of finding molecule number one with the degree of freedom x1, number two with the degree of freedom x2, and number n with the degree of freedom xn. This is the maximal statistical information that you can actually create for n body system. Having this function, you can introduce uh, Shannon entropy and associate this entropy with the physical entropy. Shannon entropy is the minus KBT average value of the logarithm of n particle distribution function. So in my notation, it's trace Pn log Pn. Now, the first term in here is just internal energy of the system. I disregard here a kinetic part of the energy, and I will explain you why I can do that. So actually, I can derive the equilibrium statistical mechanics by using either maximum Shannon's entropy principle, <coughs> subject to the condition that the average value of energy is constant, or I can equivalently minimize the free energy. You know that Hamiltonian has its minimum because Hamiltonian has its ground state. So this quantity, when calculated in the family of n particle distribution function, it will certainly have a minimum. We also know that entropy, that means minus Kb trace Pn log Pn, has a maximum. So minus entropy has a minimum. So this guy has a minimum, and this one has a minimum. So this formula has a global minimum. So actually, we can play in, with the family of distribution functions to find one which describes thermodynamics. And that's how it's usually done. So in other words, 
what we are doing is simply minimizing the free energy or maximizing entropy subject to the average free energy. The re outcome is the same. So this is my previous formula. Of course, we minimize the free energy assuming that the norm my distribution function is positive, definite, and normalized. And at the end of the day, if we do the job, we get the equilibrium free energy, which is nothing but minus kBt log Zn, when Zn is a normalization of my distribution, which appears to be exponent to minus beta Hamiltonian of the system. So it's a pretty easy way to derive statistical mechanics. I told you that I am not going to be interested in kinetical degrees of freedom. The reason for that is that the kinetic degrees of freedom for the model, I assumed at the beginning, simply factor out. So you get a kinetic contribution just as, as an additive constant, times number of molecules. And this is always a background, so to speak, for calculating the free energy. So actually the whole phase transition business takes place in here. So actually we are, we have to somehow deal with this quantity. So if you see such a formula, you see, you may think immediately, okay, I have my distribution, so I solved the problem. So why should we be bothered with it? Well, actually you didn't solve the problem because you didn't, it's very hard to calculate the normalization of the distribution. Actually the whole, business in statistical mechanics is to normalize distribution. And this normalization gives you, of course, energy, so it's free energy, so it's pretty much important. Okay, but there is another story. If you look at these formulas, if you take the interaction potential, and if you sum up exponential functions, you get something which is pretty analytical. So where do the phase transitions come from? Here, there is no phase transitions at all. Everything is analytical, analytical, as I said. Of course, you may introduce some singularities in your pair potential or, or in the interaction energy, but then the phase transition would appear is also at the level of two particles, and that's clearly not interesting. And that's not, not, not what physics is speaking about. So, in order to get true singularities, you need to go to the thermodynamic limit. And that's a very important thing. You've, thermodynamic limit means that you divide your free energy by number of particles, and then you go with the number of particles to infinity, with the volume to infinity, keeping the density constant. And in this limit, it exists independent of shape of the boundaries, and this is guaranteed given that your interaction potential falls off faster than r to the power d plus epsilon, where epsilon is greater than zero, and d is the dimensionality of your space. So with this general condition, you can prove that this limit exists, and if you calculate it, you may get something like what I showed you here. Namely, you, it may appear that in your thermodynamic parameter space, I here depicted temperature, but it doesn't matter. It could be any thermodynamical variable. You may observe that your free energy per particle calculated in thermodynamic limits has a kind of cusp. If that happens, then first derivative gives you this discontinuity. And this would monitor, the, so this, is, this mechanism is responsible for first order phase transition. Otherwise, if singularity appears in higher derivatives than the first one, we speak of continuous phase transitions. So that's the general characterization. Um, so how is it possible that when we start with the Hamiltonian, which is, let's say, we now uh, limit ourselves to liquid crystals. So, how is it possible that we start with the Hamiltonian, which has full rotational symmetry and full translational symmetry? That means I can globally rotate all particles and globally translate all of them, and the, free ener and the energy does not feel that. How it happens that we observe a phase transition? Well, and how 
could we describe this process? Well, if we just uh, consider computer simulations, then the simplest way of thinking about spontaneous symmetry breaking is just by doing a histogram of your orientations of your molecules. Namely, because it's liquid, so actually you can bring each molecule to the center of sphere and then uh, the place when the orientation of the molecule touches your sphere, you just make a point. And doing that for all particles, you get a bunch of points covering your sphere, and with that you can construct a histogram, and in the isotropic liquid, this histogram would be totally, uh, it would be a totally isotropic on a sphere. That means probability of any orientation would be just 1 over 4 pi for our model. But here, if you do the same, you will observe that molecules prefer to orient with respect to one particular direction. And immediately this preferred direction existing globally in the system would tell you that we have a global orientation order in the sample and actual <coughs> kinematics that would be the notion of the director. Mathematically speaking, the process of doing histogram is nothing but averaging of Dirac delta function omega minus omega i. I fix orientation omega and collect all molecules that are oriented along this direction. And that gives me normalized contribution uh, to my histogram. And, of course, that would uh, be seen. Um, well, the same situation would appear actually in Smectix, for instance. You would get, uh, even though your Hamiltonian has a full translational and rotational symmetry, you would get, in addition to breaking of rotational symmetry, you would get a density modulation along the director, uh, showing that uh, there is uh, additional order created in the system. In the previous case, the new variable that appeared was a director. How is it in the case of Smectix? For instance, Smectix A. In Smectix, I could say, observing Smectix, I could sit in the beginning of laboratory system of frame and try to detect the density modulation along the director. If I lower the temperature, I would spontaneously see the formation of the density wave, but this maximum of the density wave would be arbitrarily positioned with respect to the origin of my system. So, in the very much the same as in the case of pneumatics, we have uh, appearance of the director. In the case of smectics, we would get a new variable, namely z0, which is the location of the maxima of my distribution, one-dimensional distribution function. So these are new variables that appear. So if I take these one-particle distribution functions and I calculate observables, then they will appear to be non-zero. For instance, I can calculate, say, Q alpha beta tensor, let's say alignment tensor with this distribution, and of course in the isotropic phase I would get this tensor to be zero. But if I take my simulations and calculate it in the pneumatics, then I would get something which is average value of pi 2 and the direct director part, which you probably very well no, from, from the previous lectures. So, the set of phenomena which we refer to as spontaneous symmetry breaking is just appearance of non-zero values of statistical excitation values that are calculated, for instance, with one particle distribution function. Why do we call it spontaneous? It's because we want to distinguish it between, uh, we want to distinguish between formation of order, which is spontaneously formed, with respect to that which is formed, say, in the presence of boundary conditions. 
Okay. So once we know that, uh, you agree that actually we could describe all these phenomena by referring to the distribution functions and two of them, the one particle and two particle distribution functions are the most important. You see, this two particle distribution is just defined in the very much the same way as, as the one particle. The only difference is that I take two particles separated r minus r prime apart with the orientation omega r and omega prime r prime and I count pairs of molecules in my system that have this orientation and constructing this histogram I get pair distribution function. So these two functions will play important role if, in what I may, what I'm going to talk about. And now the question to you. Suppose we calculate this histogram. Suppose we calculate one particle distribution function using this distribution here. What do we get? Do we get, let's say, do we get one particle distribution which has characteristic of pneumatics? How do you think? The answer is no. So it's apparently contradictory to, to what I said you before. The problem is that if you do calculus with statistical mechanics, you know that Hamiltonian has a global rotational and translational symmetry. The trace operation, which is integration over translations and rotations, is also symmetric with respect to rotations and translations. So, this summation can never give me something which is different than 1 over 4 pi, so homogeneously distributed on a sphere. So, are these postulates, uh, are these postulates incompatible with statistical mechanics? No, because what I didn't tell you about is that when you do simulations and when you calculate one particle distribution or two particle distribution function according to the scheme which we are discussing, then actually you never know where the director will be oriented. It could be oriented in any direction of space. So actually, the spontaneous symmetry breaking, let's say going from O3 symmetric case to the infinity age, you should remember that you not only get a director, but also you get a degenerate space for the director. So actually, the director can cover, as you probably know from other lectures, just the half sphere or a projective plane. So actually, this degeneration space recovers the original symmetry of your Hamiltonian. Okay? Because the solutions that you get are completely degenerate, they are completely equivalent. Uh, you can take the orientations of the director as you please and you get the same outcome, the same result. So actually, statistical mechanics carries out additional averaging over the orientation of the director. And that is why you get everything, uh, you know, looking like for ordinary liquid. So actually, you have to do some tricks. And the trick was proposed by Bogolyubov. You may simply switch on an external field, then calculate thermodynamic limit, this external field will fix you, the director, in the thermodynamic limit. So the orientation of the director will be chosen by the system, but then when you go with the field to zero, the system will still remember uh, the direction. So in the phase transitions, you not only have a breaking of symmetry, but also breaking of ergodicity. And actually, you are dealing with not Gibson distributions. Uh, so, that's how the scenario looks like. This field does not need to be a physical field. Okay, after this preliminary things, let me tell you how the mean field theory is built in and how do we really describe the system. I showed you the formulas that are true generally. They are this is the statistical mechanics formulation of the description of your system. But of course, it's tremendously complicated. 
So actually, we have to reduce somehow 10 to 24 degrees of freedom to solve the problem of distributions. And midfield is the simplest way how to do it. How to do it. So let me systematically show you how, uh, how to introduce midfield. We simply need to limit the space of allowed functions to probe and particle distributions. And now we'll, we'll have to spend, so, so this is my formula that I minimized over Pn. And now, in order to show some interesting cases, I need to limit myself to, uh, say, interactions which are not of general type, but, say, uh, limit to pairways additive interactions. So I assume my energy to be, indeed, sum of two-body interactions. And with this limitation, the average value of energy simplifies a little. Namely, this double sum can be replaced actually by the summation over pair distribution function. You see, if you substitute this guy in here, then for Given i and j, you can integrate Pn over 1, 2, i minus 1, i plus 1, j minus 1, j plus 1, as up until xn degrees of freedom. And this will give you just pair distribution function. So pair distribution averages your pair potential. I put here tilde, you will see in a y, y. And of course, this Averaging process will be the same irrespective of the index i. So if I take index number one and sum over all possible j's, I get the same for i equal two and for all other j's not equal two. So actually, I get one half n plus something like right in here. So. To calculate the average energy, only pair uh, distribution function is involved. We know something more about this pair distribution. Namely, if the distance between particles goes to infinity, then of course particles start not feeling each other. So the correlations are lost. So in the limit of R, 1j going to infinity, you have here simple product of one particle distributions. So, actually, that would be what you account for in the limit where r1j goes to infinity. That means you can parameterize pair distribution simply as one particle distribution times one particle distribution times the rest. And this rest is called a pair correlation function. And the pair correlation function function goes to 1 as the distance goes to infinity. This is trivial. So now the energy is just one particle distribution, one particle distribution, and a guy like this. And this is needed to be modeled in order to obtain mean field or the simplest possible theory describing phase transitions. I will tell you then how this G function looks like. The G function when you take computer simulations, let's say you fix orientations of your molecules and investigate this function with the change of distance. And then you observe a lot of peaks, but this fu function goes very fast <coughs> to its asymptotic limit equal 1. Important thing is that this function vanishes when the molecules are in a close contact simply because um, there is a very strong repulsion coming from electrons and they cannot penetrate each other. Therefore, this function disappears in here. And that means this guy in here is practically zero when the particle is touched. Okay? So this has to be somehow, if we want to model this part of my formula, then we have to take this fact into account. And that's important because mean field has problems with off-lattice models. 
with lattices, there's no problem. Everything can be just easily formulated, but at this level, when we want to model this guy and only consider one particle distribution as being unknown, then we need to modify it. Okay. And how about entropy? For entropy, there is no such a problem, and I can simply approximate n particle distribution by a product of one particle distributions. Of course, I assume that all P's have the same mathematical structure. And that, of course, with these assumptions, my non equilibrium free energy is not a functional of 10 to 24 degrees of freedom of my system, but only of say, five degrees of freedom of a single molecule. So I tremendously reduce problem by cutting all correlations that might exist in the system. And now, the minimization is pretty straightforward. So actually, I define my pair interaction as a modified uh, usual pair interaction, modified in the sense that at short distances, this guy simply makes the potential equal zero. And then I can calculate something which is known as effective potential. You see, I fix molecule number one and weight the positions and orientation of molecules number j with the distribution P of j. So that's something like an effective potential fed by molecule number one because of its surroundings. With all these things and with all these simplifications, my non equilibrium free energy is just a function of, of one particle distribution, and I can easily minimize it with respect to the variation of my one particle distribution, of course, keeping normalization. And if I do that, I get something much simpler, namely, I get. Um, a formula in which um, this, I get the, the equilibrium distribution which now depends upon five variables, um, namely upon positions and orientations of the molecules, uh, that's normalization of my distribution, and it's exponent minus beta tau effective of P equilibrium. Um, this is indeed pretty simple, and well, how to deal with something like that? Namely, I would need to substitute some trial function in here, one particle trial function, calculate the effective potential according to this formula, exponentiate it, calculate normalization, and see whether I can reproduce my equilibrium distribution. So actually, mean field gives you something like nonlinear integral equation, but for one particle distribution function. So the problem is simplified, but still it's non-trivial because in the case of liquid crystals, it involves uh, multidimensional space X. So that's the interpretation of the effective potential. I have, I have my molecule number one, and sum up the interaction of the molecule number one with surroundings, but I weight this interaction with one particle distribution. So the effective potential is just uh, my trial part particle put in a homogeneous field uh, constructed from the surroundings. Now, um, as I said, the problem of solving this equation is still quite involved, so we very often approximate it, and the approximation is to introduce some sort of expansion. And take nematics. For nematics, I have a director and an orientation of my molecule, so my distribution depends upon the orientation of my molecule. Since the distribution is insensitive to the global rotation of the director and my molecule, I can do global rotation and nothing changes, the distribution should be the same. That means P depends only upon omega times n. And because of that, I can simply parameterize the distribution by expanding uh, 
p with respect to this argument and do variation or calculus with respect to the coefficients of the expansion. But if I do it just straightforwardly, straightforwardly, that wouldn't be an efficient way. The most efficient way is to expand it with respect to irreducible representation of the rotation group. In this case, these would be just Legendre polynomials. Why is it so? It's because uh, Legendre polynomials are orthogonal with respect to each other. That means the fully isotropic part is orthogonal to this guy. And because of that, when any order appears in the system, it can be monitored by these coefficients which are in front of here. And these coefficients are known as order parameters. By definition, an order parameter is something which is zero in high temperature phase and non-zero in low temperature phase. The leading term in here is just the average value of the second Legendre polynomial. And times the orientational dependence, which is like this, which can often be written as a trace, this dot means trace, of two matrices. Namely, the matrix, which is in here, times the molecular matrix, which is defined like here. You recognize immediately that this, this guy in here is j just nothing but the alignment tensor. So you can also find out immediately the alignment tensor from this formulation. Uh, now, I will show you one example how it works. This example is Mayer's Alpha theory. Mayer's Alpha took the simplest possible potential of interaction. Namely, they assumed simply point dispersion polarizabilities, interacting like minus 1 over r to the power 6. Is, this interaction can be derived using quantum mechanics, second order perturbation theory. I don't have time to tell you more about that. But anyway, the leading term would be pi, second Legendre polynomial of uh, the orientations depending upon scalar product of the orientations of the molecules minus 1 over r to the power 6. And it's assumed that this interaction potential is valid for r greater than r naught, while otherwise it's zero. You see, here is this effect I told you at the beginning. We need to assume that the molecules cannot penetrate each other when they are very close together. And that's, that has been explicitly bit, built in into the model by Mayer Zalp. Um, if you assume that, then it's pretty straightforward to calculate the effective potential. And I give you detailed calculations in my PDF file, which will be associated with this talk. But because my time is nearly over, let me skip details. You must believe me that the effective interaction calculated for this particular model is particularly simple. You see, it's just minus density times something which comes from the integrations over space, which is V, average value of second Legendre polynomial times pi 2 omega times n. So it's pretty easy. So my distribution function actually depends on, upon only one variational parameter. So the very complex problem has been reduced to determining only the average value of pi 2. And I can determine it self-consistently by multiplying this equation by pi 2 omega times n and integrating over omega. And if you do that, you find something pretty easy, uh, pretty easy to solve with mathematica is five minutes. Namely, you get the equation, self-consistent equation for the average value of p2, which is just in one-dimensional integral of p2 of x with the exponent average value of p2, p2 of x, divided by t, the x, and the normalization. Note that this equation always has the solution, the average value of p2 equals 0. If I substitute 0 in here, then because of orthogonality of Legendre polynomials, I get integral from 0 to 1 of p2, which will be 0, so I get 0. So 0 is 0. But the interesting thing is that you can show that this simple equation, just by playing with Mathematica, also possess 
one, two, three other solutions. And these are depicted in here. So, the problem is much more interesting. And if you calculate now the free energy, which can be done easily, you find that actually this model corresponds to the first to the model of first order phase transition. Namely, here are branches of the free energy, and the blow-up of this regime is shown in here. Um, exactly at this point where the story starts, of so the highest temperature where the non-zero solution appears, we are in here. So we are much higher than the energy of the zeroth solution. Okay? So still stable is the isotropic phase in here. Now, if we go around this branch in here, then we are here, on this line. The most interesting is this solution as you see from colors. Namely, this solution, it starts at T double star. Initially, it has higher energy, but it, this energy drops down when the temperature approaches the value equals Tc. At Tc exactly, you get the same free energy for the isotropic phase as for the pneumatic phase. That's exactly this point in here. And that's the point where the transition takes place. And we have a jump in the order parameter, which simply means that the phase transition is of the first order. You see, this branch is metastable. It has, although it has the free energy, which is lower than the energy of the isotropic solution, still this free energy is higher than the free energy of the main solution. So that branch never becomes stable. And now the comparison with the experiment. It's, it's very amazing that if you just fit one parameter which appears in the theory, and that's Tc, to your experimental data, you can rescale them all to show pretty universal character. When you see something like that, and you are experimentalist, you, you know that, that probably you need one extra parameter to describe the situation, because they are pretty regular. And that's really amazing. Uh, situation actually, and that's. And now I will try try to explain you why is it so, why this agreement is so good. I should say that this agreement is not that good for entropy and for other parameters, which depend strongly on correlations. Actually, the diagram I showed you depends virtually on the symmetry of the problem, and that's why you have this universality. And this, why is it so? Let me show you that more clearly. Namely, we have been dealing with the formulas like this one. We had an effective potential, and then we calculated effective free energy, one particle free energy. The most <coughs> crucial was the one particle distribution function and its symmetry. And its symmetry was encoded with the Legendre polynomials. Now, irrespective of the shape of the potential, if you do this trace, at the end of the day, you recover that the leading terms are of this form. You see, minus V2, average value of P2, P2 n times omega 1. Perhaps there are further corrections, but apparently these corrections are not that relevant for, for, for pneumatics. So you see, you didn't need to start actually with uh, mayer alpha. You could start with arbitrary pair interaction, and you would get something like this. Uh, arbitrary, I, I'm not quite uh, correct in here, but uh, let's say nearly arbitrary. But what is more, if you do some more advanced theoretical treatment of your pneumatic isotropic phase transition, you find out that the most of theoretical treatments are of the same form. The only difference is the pairing interaction potential is replaced by the so-called direct pair correlation function, which is a quite, quite complex quantity. I don't want to go that deeply into it. But anyway, the mathematical structure is at the level of pair correlations is the same as of mean field. 
Therefore, again, if you work hard, at the end of the day, you get a similar expression. So the symmetry is crucial, okay? Symmetry actually dictates how your expansion looks like. Um, okay, so now can we do... So, so <clears throat> you see, that's the story actually. But there is one more thing which, which I would like to emphasize. Can we learn something from this sort of theory without going through this rather complex mathematics? At least when you do it for the first time, it might look complex. And I will tell you, there is a way. Namely, instead of... Okay, this is again non-equilibrium free energy, the first one I started with but written in terms of, of uh, expansion uh, using the order parameter concept. So my one particle distribution function was just uh, replaced by uh, series in Legendre polynomials. So this is just P log P, okay? If you do it for, do it for Mayer Zaupe, you get something like that. And now, you may construct what Landau did for the first time, namely you may expand this expansion about this point in here, about the point when the non-zero solutions branch off from the zeroed one. This sort of expansion is called Landau expansion. And if you do that for, for this sort of, of expression, it's just an exercise on Taylor expansion in multi multivariable Taylor expansion, so it's pretty easy. Then you, you recover something like what I showed here. So you have powers of pi 2 squared, cube, etc. Note that the quadratic part can change sign. Namely, when t is less than one-fifth, that's this point here, then this quadratic part in the order parameter changes sign. The other parts do not, they are just multiplied by t, so the sign is just fixed. So I like you to remember that. So exactly at the bifurcation in here, you get the change of sign in the... So at least you may hope that you can explain what's going on in the system close to t equal one-fifth. And that's indeed the case. Um, but in order to understand that, just let's eliminate all other order parameters but keep the dominant one which is P2. So that means let's minimize with respect to all other, so with respect to P4, P6, etc. This is pretty easy and if you do so and write down the renormalized free energy, then you get something which, that's nearly the last formula of mine, then you get something which is expressed only in the leading order parameter and it's precisely what you can find in the textbooks on Landau theory Expl except for the fact that this t is just replaced by one-fifth namely the expansion is precisely taken at the bifurcation now you see that this change of sign is due to competition between energy and entropy while these higher order terms are only due to entropy because they are proportional to t and in our original formulation that was that was simply the term the only term that was measured uh, weighted by temperature was the entropy equivalently you can express this in terms of alignment tensor so actually this is the alignment tensor expansion this is the Landau formulation of, of the Mayer's output and you see that actually you could construct that by knowing the symmetry of Q. And uh, that would lead to the same sort of formulation. Okay, so that's nearly all. And the analysis of this last equation gives you the same results as the original mean field theory, actually. Thanks for your attention. Concurrent picture to the docs you saw. Very <laughs> okay, any questions uh, really fast, uh, or you can talk to afterwards.
Yes, please. You mentioned the possibility of reentrant topologies. Yes. And I wanted to ask under what conditions you might see that. Well, in this simple mean field treatment, you probably cannot see it if you do not implement it somehow into the theory. But when the reentrance happens, so that means reversal of the symmetry actually, then you need to find a mechanism that eats up entropy. So usually there is some, you know, uh, uh, short scale orientational order induced in the system that eats up entropy and that's better for the system than just to keep the long range order of the, of the previous kind. That's usually what happens. Other questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you.